So in the book of Mark, Mark presents Jesus as a servant. Okay, so Matthew presents Jesus as king. Mark presents Jesus as a servant. So Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke presents Jesus as a human. Luke was a doctor, so he presents, you know, Jesus as a, as a human. So he looks at things from a, a human's perspective. And then Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John looks at Christ as the Son of God. So that's why when you read the, the Gospel of John, that's one of the best books in the Bible. It's one of the best books, in my opinion, to see Jesus as the Son of God because that's how he views him. You should have two pages, right, Shereen? Okay. All right, you're getting there. No problem. Now, when we say that Jesus is the promised Messiah, let's, let's be honest. We don't just get up and jump for joy about that, right? Why? Because we're not Jewish. Okay? If you were Jewish, since the time you were a little tyke, you know, a little rascal running around, you were taught that one day the Messiah would come. One day the Messiah was going to come, and then they were also taught that the Messiah would come and set up his kingdom. Okay? So the reason why people had a difficult time with Jesus was Jesus came not as a king to set up his kingdom, but as a servant, like Mark saw him, to suffer and die. You see the difference? So the Jews were all, all along, they were saying, no, 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 you know, when the Messiah comes, he's going to reign. It's a political reign. It's a national reign. It's a spiritual reign. You know, they were excited. But then when Jesus came, it was like, we know this guy. And, and this guy is not here, you know, even though he, he drew crowds, he wanted to what? He wanted to almost remain in isolation, right? You know, you, it's, it's really strange because he would heal people and say, hey, don't tell anybody what I just did. You know, I just healed you, Henry. Don't say anything. And Henry would get like a megaphone and tell everybody in his neighborhood, you're not going to believe what happened to me, right? So we find this, it's almost like a, you know, like two sides. You know, he's healing people, but then he doesn't want anyone to know. He doesn't want to draw attention. But the Jew wanted a Messiah that would reign politically, reign nationally, and reign spiritually. What they forgot was Isaiah 53. So if you haven't read Isaiah 53, I would encourage you after tonight, go back and read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 talks about the death of Christ, talks about how he was, you know, like a lamb before it shears, is silent, and it's really graphic. I mean, it really is. But in some manuscripts, they remove that. You know, so, you know, even in Jewish manuscripts, they remove that because it's a hard thing to accept. There are other reasons, but that is certainly one of them. So, like I said, Jesus is the promised Messiah. None of us jumps out of our chair and says, yes. Why? Because we weren't told from a little, little boy or little, little girl how important this was for the Messiah to come. And they are still waiting even today. Now, look at the third point. This one, most of us know, Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus was born of a virgin. So what does that mean? That means she had no sexual relations, okay? And the Holy Spirit conceived the child in her womb. Now we do know, and I think we mentioned this during Christmas time this last year, we do know that Jesus had other brothers. Okay, we know that there's several passages in the New Testament that talk about your mother and your brothers. They're out there waiting for you. So that's not a, a secret. You know, it really isn't. So Mary was not a, a virgin for her entire life. She was just a virgin up until Jesus was born. And then obviously she had other kids. Now, why is it so important that Jesus was born of a virgin? Well, one of the reasons is 700 years, oh, I like this color, it's nice. 700 years before the birth of Christ, it was what? It was predicted that Jesus would be born through a virgin. Okay, there was even a, a king and a whole conversation, and it kind of alluded to the fact that, hey, you know, a, a king is coming, another king is coming. And in so Isaiah, let me see if I have it here, hold on. Uh, Isaiah 7.14. 
That's okay. It's a good question, though, to ask somebody. All right, very good. So it's in Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14. I may have it on the right. Let me see. Yeah, you have it. You yeah, all right. In the text. Okay, so let's read it there on the bottom right. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, here's another thing that sometimes uh, trips up people. Okay? The word Emmanuel, okay, means God with us, okay? Jesus, salvation, anointed, anointed one, okay. So, when Jesus was around, there was, and there's several references in the New Testament where they said, God is with us. Okay? So Emmanuel is really the, the title. He will be called. In other words, that's a title. That's one thing that used to confuse me early on. I would say, well, but his name is Jesus. He said his name was Emmanuel. But no, it's a title. He would be called. So they would say about him that God is with us. Okay, that's the idea. They would say, oh, Emmanuel, God is with us. Jesus, what his name means is salvation, anointed one, etc. Now, so just a little clarification there. So then he was born of a virgin, and notice what God did. God chose a simple family to deliver the king. Okay, he wasn't born into a royal family. You know, he wasn't in the palace like Moses was for many, many years. He was born into a very, very poor family. Notice this section right here in the middle. It says, we are loved by the Father, saved through the Son, and changed by the Holy Spirit. That's very important. I am loved by the Father. I am saved through the Son. I am changed by the Holy Spirit. So God loved us, right? He sent Christ to die on the cross for us. So he saved us. And then the Spirit's job is to what? Transform us into who? The image of Christ. So you see how they're all, you know, they're all tied together. And we look at, as we look at the scripture, we, we see this over and over again, especially in the writings of Paul. So, you know, the Father loved us. It's a bad rendition of a heart. Okay? So he sent Christ to die for us. And then the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us. And how does He transform us? He transforms us from the renewing of our, of our mind. He changes how we think about things. Now, look at the next major point. Jesus lived His life in full submission to the Father and without sin. And without sin. Now, a lot of people struggle with this. Why? Because we all sin, right? <laughs> you know, how can you live a life and be, and be tempted and just never sin? Not even, not even once. Well, think about it this way, and this might help you. How many of you have ever been on a diet for, let's say, four months, and you were good for four months? Okay? Three months. <laughs> Three months. Nobody raised their hand. Okay, two weeks. Two weeks. All right. So what, what happens when you are trying to, and again, it could be for, for different reasons. Hey, I want to have more protein in my diet, so I want to try to cut, cut out you know, carbs and stuff like that. Okay, that's fine. But what happens when you have that focus and you're only focusing on, let's say, proteins, and you're trying to get rid of rice and bread, all that stuff that tastes really, really good. Anyway, sorry, digressing. So you, you get away from that, and then... You know, a week goes by, and then two weeks go by, and you realize, man, this isn't that difficult, right? After a while, you become more sensitive when someone offers you, you know, a nice big slab of Cuban lard called Cuban bread, right? Then you're like, no, I'll pass. I'll just have the cafe con leche. You can have the Cuban bread. But, but what happens when we are used to living a certain way? What, what happens? You know, little by little... You know, it's not that we crave it less, it's just that we, we learn how to handle it, handle it and live without it. Now, imagine 
Christ was in heaven. There's no sin in heaven. The one who lifted up his, you know, his chest in pride, what? He got kicked out. That was Satan. One third of the angels. That means two thirds stayed. You know, one third was gone. So then there's no sin in heaven. Jesus is not surrounded by sinners. So now the Holy One of God comes to the earth. And what does he find? Sin. Where? Everywhere. everywhere. So there's sin everywhere. But guess what? He's been from that point to eternity past, which is forever, without what? Sin. Without sin. So his perspective on sin is different because we were born into sin, right? We were born into sin. We were, we were conceived, you know, we, we have sin, a sin nature. But he was more, and, and I want to use the word hyper-focused, than we will ever be because he had never sinned. So I think when we look at this idea of Jesus never sinned, we have to remember he lived or he has lived for all of these years and years without sin. So when he came to this earth and obviously he took on the form of a flesh and, you know, uh, Philippians 2 says that, you know, he, he basically put himself to the side so that he can be here and be with us and you know he became a man I mean that was you know he became a lower being but he never sinned so because he never sinned he was the only one who could go to the cross for our sin as much as people talk about Muhammad and Buddha guess what those guys sinned they were not perfect you go to any priest, any pastor, they are not perfect. I am not perfect. Every one of us has sinned. So when he came, it was so important that he lived in full submission to the Father because whatever the Father said, that he would do. So I always find that fascinating. I think, man, all of those years. And temp yes, was he temp tempted? Absolutely. You know, in the book of Hebrews, if I'm not mistaken, I think also in John, he says, you know, he was tempted, but without what? Sin. Without sin. So that's why we can look at Christ and what he did and say, okay, he was the only one who could really satisfy the payment of God. Caesar, yes. That speaks also to the uniqueness <clears throat> of Christ as opposed to God the Father and the Holy Spirit because God cannot be in the presence of sin. But Christ obviously had that characteristic and mm -hmm. was able to come yeah. down and be amongst us. Yeah. He came he came among us and he just just imagine, you know, you, you bring up a good point. Just imagine the torment he must have experienced. Never being around sin, and now sin is like all over the place. You see it, you hear it, you might even smell it. But it's everywhere. And he just keeps going. He just keeps going. And he just lives his life without sin. And he just keeps going. And then you have to also think, how compassionate is God that even though he knew he was coming here to a world full of sin, he lived among sinners for 33 years, roughly. And he still went to the cross and he died for our sins although having never sinned. I mean, that's pretty amazing. It really is. Because none of us could have fulfilled that role. None of us. But because Christ is the Messiah, the Lamb of God, you know, He is white like snow as far as, you know, without sin. He was the only one who could have paid the price. So that's why when you read the book of Re Revelation and then you hear John say, I was really upset because there was a scroll and nobody could open the scroll, right? And who was the one that opens the scroll? The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Okay, so very, very good. Now, look here at the bottom of this section where Jesus lived his, his life in full submission of the Father. Notice here in the second paragraph, it says, Jesus had a very simple and yet profound plan for his time here on earth. He listened to the Father, watched what the Father was doing, and followed the Father's instructions. Listen, watch, and follow. 
Isn't that cool? Listen, watch, and follow. You know, this doesn't happen to me all the time. You know, sometimes it does, and I'm sure it's the same for you. You know, so yesterday I was half asleep. I get up, and, you know, I'm still recovering from the, the week that I've had. And, you know, I get up and I go outside because, you know, we have the recycle bins and the recycle guy is about to come. And, you know, Yami doesn't like when there's a bunch of recycle stuff on the counter. So I get up and say, okay, let me just take this out before she comes downstairs. And then there's a guy out there with some shades. He looks like a bug. I mean, you can't see his eyes at all. But he starts talking and he says, hey, you look really tired. I go, yeah, I'm really tired. He goes, how many beers did you have last night? <laughs> And I kind of laughed. I go, no, last night I didn't have any, you know. <laughs> I didn't have any last night. He goes, oh, I had five and I'm really tired. So he just comes over and he starts talking to me. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm half asleep here, but okay, here we go. So we start talking. And then he's telling me about, you know, all the beers he's had and late night and all the work because we have bulk pickup tomorrow and all this stuff. And, and the guy's a trip. He's really funny. He's from Jamaica, so I love the accent. And, you know, we're just talking. And then all of a sudden... I go, look, no, I'm just really tired because, you know, I have to get up early today. I've got to study for a class I'm teaching at church. So this is after the beers, right? So, he's, you know, he's, then he starts to, oh, you go to church? Where do you go to church? And I found that he goes to church somewhere. And there was no more beer talk after that. But anyways, <laughs> but it's just funny how, how God will connect you. And, and Jesus Christ really becomes that, that connecting point. You know, where are you in your relationship with Christ? Obviously, if you're having five beers, you know, you may not be totally coherent the next day. But, but you know, you never know who God is going to put in your path just to encourage, just to point them back to the Savior. But, but notice what it says here. It says, listen, watch, and follow. And I think this is very important because one of the things that I want to mention tonight especially is we should follow that same pattern. Listen. Now, I'm not going to tell you that God speaks to me every single day. Okay, that's not true. It doesn't happen. But there are times that God impresses on my heart or God will put somebody in front of me like this, brother, because I have to say something to him. And I don't know exactly what because I was really half asleep. But then I kind of figure out, okay, Lord, you wanted me to talk to this guy. I get it now. So now we're talking. But if we're listening, you know, I don't always get it on the first time. Some of you surely are sharper than I am. But, you know, if we're listening, if we're watching, then God will show us what we need to do, what we need to say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I love this. Listen, watch, and follow. So during that time, I wanted to just go back in and have another cup of coffee and go upstairs and, and study. But obviously God had led this guy. You know, he walked across the street, started talking, and said, okay, you know, I, I get it, Lord. I get, the, I get the hint. But notice what Jesus did. He listened to the Father, and he told his disciples something very important. I can only do what the Father tells me to do. Now think about this. He is the Son of God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet, he submitted himself to the will of the Father while he was here on earth. Does that fascinate you? I mean, talk about a model for obedience. That's a model for obedience. You know, sometimes we don't always wake up wanting to submit to the will of the Father, right? That's just the reality. I mean, it's just the truth. Sometimes we wake up and it's like, you know, I really want to do this today. I really want to do that. And, you know, we're not saying, Lord, you, here's my agenda. What do you want me to do today? But Jesus did. So that's an example, I think, for you and for I to follow. Now, notice here the last verse on page one on the right hand side. Notice what Jesus said. For I have come down from heaven, not to do whose will? Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So his entire life, all 33 years, was in submission to the Father. Whatever the Father said, he did. Whatever the Father instructed, he followed. Okay, that's a great example for you and me. Now, let's look at the next point. Jesus is our Redeemer. The only mediator between God and man. How many of you have ever been to a mediation or you've ever been to jury duty where you saw attorneys or mediators in action? How many of you? Let me see your hands, okay? Isn't that an interesting experience? You know, I had a federal 
jury, I had a civil one, and then I had to be part of a mediation. Some guy was suing, well, let me, let me back up, the management company was suing our association. I'm the president of the association, like I need one more thing to do, you know, I'm the president, so they said, hey, we need you to be part of this mediation. I'm like, okay, let's go. So we went down to Coral Springs, and we were there like, I don't know, three hours on a Wednesday evening or something, and then the attorney, you know, for the, you know, his, his client said, okay, we're going to sue you for X amount of thousands of dollars. And I'm thinking, we don't even have that much in our budget. So I know we're going to have to negotiate here. And we went back and forth. And this guy, he met with both of us. And then he met, actually, there were three of them and one of me. And so he met with them. And then he met with me. And then he met with them. And then he met with me. And then I said, okay, here's my concession. Here you go. He would take it over to them. They would say, no, we want this, this, this. They would, and then then the attorney came back at the end. I was tired. You know, it was past my bedtime already. It was like 8 o'clock. And I said, look, the person who was here before, the former president, he essentially took two houses and quick claim deed them to himself under his son's name. I'm not looking to get rid of your company. I am looking to work with your company and clean up the mess the former president left behind. So when I said that, the guy said, so you're not looking to get rid of the company? No, I never said that. He said, okay. So then they came back in and they said, well, here's what we're proposing. You know, we'll drop this lawsuit. And if you cover the attorney's fees, we'll start at zero and you sign a new contract. I said, okay, great. Where do I sign? So we signed the new contract. You know, we only had to pay like, you know, 3,000, which was pennies compared to $70,000 plus, plus going to trial. Now, the mediator did his job. What was he trying to do? He was trying to say, hey, Louis, and hey, Marcel, you guys have to get to an agreement. I'm going to stand in the gap for you two. I'm going to make sure that you're satisfied and you're satisfied and you guys walk out of here with something signed so that we can move on and this case doesn't limbo or doesn't go to court. You know, that was the, the idea. So what does a mediator do? Well, a mediator stands in the gap and they try to work things out. So who is Jesus mediating for? He's mediating for us and he's also mediating for, for God. So now all of a sudden, he says, okay, Marcel, you have sin. God is not going to accept your sin. You are separated from God. God, you are holy, you are perfect, you are just. There needs to be a payment for your sin. You can't pay it, Marcel. So uh, you can't pay it, Victor. You can't pay it, Henry. I'm going to pay it. So I'm going to pay the penalty. So God, the Father, is going to be satisfied. You're going to be satisfied because you're going to be saved by grace. And you don't even have to pay for it. And then I'm going to pay for this mediation with my very own blood. Is that powerful or what? So the person who was totally guilty, in this case it was me, did absolutely nothing but got what? Full benefits of the mediation. That's what a mediator does. So now notice the phrase here, only. If you haven't underlined that word, underline that word only. And then notice the last verse, on that second paragraph. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So let's go to the next page. And again, some of the stuff you can read at home. I didn't want to um, read all this. I just wanted to highlight some things here. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he was buried in a tomb. Died on the cross for our sins and he was buried in a tomb. Now, one of the most difficult things for us to listen to, especially as we get closer to Easter, is like the Good Friday sermons, right? The Good Friday sermons are never the super uplifting sermons, right? Why? Because they focus on the death of Christ. Okay, so look here at John 10. It's right in the center of the page where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. 
Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. In other words, there were other people that he wanted to bring into his kingdom. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Who's the shepherd? Jesus is the shepherd. Who's the flock? That's all of us, everyone who's saved. For this reason, it says, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority, notice that word, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from who? From my Father. Okay, so the reality was Jesus in his own authority laid down his life for us. Okay, what killed Jesus? Was it the Romans? No, was it the Jews? No, it was our sin. <laughs> our sin nailed him to the cross. He allowed himself to be killed by the Romans, you know, found guilty by the Jews, but the reality was we're the ones that killed them, our sin. Now, I love the metaphors the Bible uses to describe Jesus. Shepherd, lamb, you know, mediator, all these things, they help us to get a picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Now, look at the next point here. It says, Jesus lives and reigns forever, and reigns forever in a holy kingdom that lasts forever. If you have never listened through the book of Revelation, notice I said listen. It would be worth your time. You can go to BibleGateway.com. You can go to... Um, you know, English Standard Version or NIV or some other version that you enjoy or Spanish. And you can listen through the book of Revelation probably, I think it's like 45 minutes if I'm not mistaken. The whole book of Revelation in about 45, 50 minutes. But one of the things that you find is that in the book of Revelation, there is no doubt, I mean no doubt at all, that when Jesus comes again, he's coming with authority and power to rule and to reign. You know, first he comes to take us home, and then after that he comes to rule and reign and destroy his enemies. And when you listen through the book of Revelation, you know, you almost get that feeling like, wow, we really do win in the end. <laughs> I mean, in the end, Christ is going to come again, Christ is going to conquer his enemies, and it's not going to be this long, you know, 350-year-old war. It's going to be swift it's going to be decisive. Now, the next point. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He paid the penalty in full. Now I'm going to get some of you to help me read a little bit. Okay, so notice here on the right-hand side, starting in the middle of the page where it says Ephesians 2.18 and all the way down through the last one, Romans 3.23. I'd like somebody to read Ephesians 2.18, and then other people read the other verses that follow below. Okay, so who'd like to start? Ephesians 2.18. <clears throat> For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2.8. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Okay. 1 Peter 3.18 In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1.7 As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.10 For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Thank you, Louis. Okay, so as you look at these verses... You know, notice Philippians 2.8. It says, being found in appearance as a man. What did he do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, when it says Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, another word for propitiation is substitute. Okay? So if you want to write that down on the margin, substitute. In other words, he took our place. Our place was to die for our sins. Our place was to get the punishment for our sins. On the cross, He paid for the punishment. He received that punishment in full. 
Okay, so 100% of our punishment, he absorbed on the cross. That's, that's very, really, really important. Because I remember when I was a new believer, and I was really aware of my sin. I mean, I was so aware of my sin, I think I got saved like 100 times in a month. You know, I was just constantly, Lord, forgive me, you know, come into my heart, because I was so made aware of my sin, and I didn't have the understanding that, you know, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you. You know, I thought, no, no, I got to, you know, get saved again and again and again because, you know, I'm just a horrible person. But the reality is, when Jesus became our substitute, when we confess our sins to God, we accept Christ as our Savior, now we begin a what? A new relationship. I am no longer the Marcel of yesterday. I'm a new person in Christ. So now God doesn't see me as his enemy, because that's what we were before Christ. We were enemies of God. Now God sees you and I as what? Sons and daughters. You see the difference? Big difference. So if I am an enemy of God, should I fear God? Yes or no? Absolutely. Why? He's going to win with no doubt. I am going to lose. But if I am a son of God, or if I am a daughter of God, then I don't need to fear God in that way. Now, I do have to have a healthy respect for God, but I don't have to live in this, oh my gosh, I, I got to watch every single word I say, and, and you know, what if this, and what, you know, I'll never forget, I was in the gym, obviously, many years ago. I was in the gym with these friends of mine, talking like 25 years ago, and and this guy in the gym, I was talking to a friend of mine, and we do this all the time, right? We're talking to somebody, but we're really listening to another conversation. So the guy that had the other conversation, he, he dropped an F-bomb, right? And I'm talking to my friend, and I dropped an F-bomb. And he looked at me with his face like, shocked, like, what did you just say? And I'm like, what did I just say? <laughs> The problem was I was listening to another conversation and I repeated what the guy said and I, I felt terrible, but the look on my friend's face was priceless. You know, that was just classic. But when we look at our sins, we know that, hey, if I mess up, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know, God is not going to just cast me off as far as the east is. He's going to forgive me as I confess my sins to him. Now the other thing is that we have to keep in mind, Jesus forgives us at the level that we forgive other people. So it's not just, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Part of that forgiveness is, am I forgiving other people? Because if I'm not forgiving other people, going back to the Lord's Prayer, forgive us as we forget what? We forgive who? Others, our debtors, right? So in relation to how I forgive others, God forgives me. If I refuse to forgive others, guess what? God's waiting for me to forgive them before He forgives me. So assuming that I have forgiven others, I have free access to ask God for forgiveness without any reservation, without any fear that I'm not going to be forgiven. Now, 1 Peter 3.18, and Louis read it here, he says, Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. So, because Jesus suffered, and you're going to see this now as we get closer to Easter, you're going to see people that are going to get on their knees and crawl on their knees for like a mile, and they're bleeding everywhere, and it's like... Then you're going to also see people, in other countries particularly, who crucify themselves and people they you know they get on a cross and they nail them and it's like no you don't have to do that it has already been done and even if you do do that it's not what it's not sufficient it's not enough so sometimes people have a really weird interpretation of the bible but if they look at what Christ has already done, remember in the video, I think it was last week or the week before, it's not about what you can do, it's what about God has done. It's done. So because God has done these things, you and I can live in freedom, not in, in fear. Okay, very, very important. Now, look here down at the bottom where it says Jesus is our Passover. 
1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul writes, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So remember the story of Moses, right? Moses went to Egypt, said, Yo, Pharaoh, let my people go. He said, No, they won't go. He came back and said, Pharaoh, let my people go. He said, No, they won't go. And he did that, you know, a ton of times, right? And then finally, the Lord said, Hey, this night the death angel is going to pass. And unless you have the blood stain of a lamb on your door, you know, the firstborn is going to die. Once that firstborn died, that's it. They were free to go. But the blood on the lamb or the the, the lamb's blood on the doorpost was a foreshadowing of what Christ was going to do on the cross. In other words, what we see in the Old Testament is a shadow of what Christ reveals in the New Testament. And many times what we read in the New Testament is what is yet to come as it relates to prophecy in Christ at the end times. So Christ is our Passover. What does that mean? He has already poured out His blood for us. We don't need to pour out our blood. We don't need to, you know, only eat fish on Friday. We don't need to do any of these traditions. Why? Because what he has done is already done. Now, if you want to eat fish on a Friday, that's fine. That's not a big deal. But that's not what your salvation and my salvation rests on. It's not on whether we eat meat or we don't eat meat. It's not whether we, you know, inflict harm to ourselves or we don't. Everything has already been done. Now, look at the next one on the next page. Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. Look at John 20, 5 through 10 here on the right margin. This is a great, it's a great passage. It says, And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him. He's talking about John, the Apostle John, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, talking about John, who had reached the tomb first, because he was faster, also went in. And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So what was happening here? It was the day of the resurrection. Okay, The disciples, as we heard early this morning, they were in a depression. Why? Because they were following this rabbi for you know, three, three and a half years. And all of a sudden they realize he's dead. You know, everybody saw us with this rabbi. So we're going to get killed as well. You know, there was a persecution that was going to start. They were nervous and they didn't know what was going on. But as soon as they got to the tomb, things started making sense little by little by little. Have you ever found in your life how there are times when you have no answers and all of a sudden, like from one day to the next, God begins to make connections in your life little by little by little. And then you begin to understand. You may not understand the why of everything, but little by little, He reveals Himself. Notice the, the next verse here on the bottom right. Jesus, this is the same, the same time after, short time after. Jesus said to her, this is a woman who went to see the tomb. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that she and that he had been, I'm sorry, and that he had said these things to her. So why is the resurrection 
so important? The resurrection is important because it puts a, a stamp on everything that Jesus proclaimed. In other words, without the resurrection, you and I would probably never meet. Think about that. Without the resurrection, without the church, we would probably never meet in a building like this, you know, singing on Sunday mornings, listening to God's word, because if the resurrection didn't happen, it doesn't matter. He's just another what? He's just another prophet. He's just another guy that told great stories, draw big crowds, you know, did some cool stuff with fish and bread, but it doesn't matter because he didn't resurrect. Now, because he resurrected, that changes what? Everything. That changes everything. So because he resurrected, we have a living hope in Christ and our hope is not meaningless. Okay? When I was studying Buddhism and Hinduism and all the isms, you know, a couple of months ago, you know what really hit me? What a lack of hope these people have who study and practice these religions. Because there is nothing that gives them absolute certainty about the hope for their future. You know, you know, Marcio, you are an okay dude. You're going to reincarnate as a snail. Okay, is that hopeful? No. You know, if you were a little bit better, then you might reincarnate as a, as a palm tree. You know, it's like, really? Is that? I mean, I, I would go crazy, I think, if that was the only hope I had. And then you, you know, you switch over to the Islamic faith, and it's, well, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to pray. And like this friend of mine did, he bought a clicker. So every time he would pray, he would click it, and he was trying to pray 10,000 times a day. And I'm like, that's exhausting. How can you work when you're just thinking about, I got to pray 10,000 times a day, and every time I pray, I got to click this clicker. You know, so it's, it's exhausting. It, there is no hope. But the difference is, Jesus himself, the mediator, is our hope. So what I want you guys to be encouraged about is, our faith is not based on tradition. Our faith is not based on just some, you know, really cool stories. Our faith is based on the work of God in Christ who rose from the dead. And that's why one day you and I have, what? The certainty that we will also rise from the dead. I've been to funerals where people that were dead knew Christ. And I've been to funerals where people who were dead did not know Christ. And let me tell you, there's a huge difference. When I have to speak at a funeral where the person did not know Christ, very difficult for me. It's very difficult. But what a difference when you go to a funeral and somebody knows Christ and, and the celebration. But the resurrection is what changes all of that. Now, notice here it says in black and white, our hope is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The next one says, Jesus is our prophet and priest. Now, I probably need to add one more thing there, and I'll go back and add it now that I think about it. I think I have it here, the blue one. Uh, Lou, you have a yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, so, um, go ahead. You know, people always ask me when I went to India, you know, what, why, why was it so hard for you? And, and that brought out a good point when you were talking about, because I started to, to really look into the, uh, the Hindu faith. Sure. Started to study it some. And they just, because, like we live in hope, they live in fear. Yeah. And it's it's really it's really depressing to know yeah. that those people live in fear through so many gods that they believe in, and just the people itself. As you travel through those towns, they were just very serious people. They weren't happy people. Yeah. And it just took an effect on me. Absolutely. There's the no thing, there's yeah. no joy, and yeah, it's no it's hard. The other thing I yeah. want to just point out, and as you read uh, John twenty five through ten, mm -hmm. when it talks, it just says it right there when John says also went in and he saw and believed yeah and that's that was the turning yeah. point right there yeah um, for the disciples and absolutely and, and they saw it yeah. i mean and if you put yourself in their shoes these were guys just like us as far as you know they, they weren't you know the leading politicians of the day they were hard-working people right and they they weren't you know, fools either. So they, they, they wanted to check things out and, and, and some of them went a little further, but 
when they walked in and they saw the re he's not there, you know, and the Roman guards that were there, you know, they were gone, they had taken off, then all of a sudden everything started to make sense. So we said that Jesus is prophet, priest, but there's one I left out, and king. Okay? Typically, when you look at the Old Testament, you see prophets, right? Uh, some of those prophets were, were what? They were priests, right? But typically, you don't see a prophet, priest, and a king. We remember King Saul, the first king of Israel? He wanted to be a priest. Big mistake, right? Lost his, his kingship, lost everything, because that's not why God called him. He called him to be a, a king, but he got afraid, and that fear made him sin. So, but many times you see in the Old Testament, prophet and priest, prophet and priest, you know, you see King David. King David was what? He was a king. Okay, he, he wasn't a, a priest, he was a psalmist. You know, he spoke, he prophesied, but when you see this combination, it really applies to, to Christ. You know, he is the, the prophet, he is the priest, he is the king. And then, when you start to look at the book of Hebrews, which is a book that we're going to study in the future, the book of Hebrews goes back and it talks about all of these things, but then it says, it, essentially what the book of Hebrews says is, but now in Christ, things are better. So did we have prophets in the past? Sure. Did we have priests in the past? Sure. Did we have kings in the past? Sure. But now in Christ, things are better. Now, I mentioned this last time. Old Testament, New Testament, right? What did we say the word testament means? Remember? Covenant. Promise. That's what it means. So the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that God made with Israel consisted of prophets, priests, and kings, right? The New Covenant, okay, is made in the blood of who? Of Christ. So the Old Prophet or the Old Covenant was made in the blood of animals, right? I mean, can you imagine being a priest, especially during the Day of Atonement in these days, and your job is just to kill animals and to sacrifice animals and to, sh I mean, it was a constant reminder of our sin and the price that had to be paid, which was the life of an animal for our sin. But now we jump over into the New Testament and now we see a better, that's the key word, a better covenant. So when you think of Jesus, Jesus is the author of a better covenant. It's better than what they had in the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament, they had as much as they had. And they knew the Messiah was coming. That's why I said in the beginning, when I say Messiah to us, it's really not something that we just get up and shout about. But for the person in the Old Covenant, this Messiah would come and redeem Israel and take Israel to the next level. The difference was, they thought he was coming in to make a political and social, you know, revival, but he didn't. It was a spiritual awakening, a spiritual revival, and that's what his first coming did. But now in his second coming, now's when we're going to see Jesus as King and Lord. So in his first coming, he came in, in weakness. He came in humility. And then in his second coming, he's going to come as King and and as Lord to save his people. So let's look at the last point. The last point. Jesus is our king. He will return to conquer and reign forever. He will return to conquer and reign forever. Now, and again, we're going to talk about this in a in a future class, but it's, it's helpful just to see a quick diagram. I think I'm smearing more than I'm erasing, right? 
Let me try to erase this. Yeah, it's okay. We'll clean it up after. Okay? So here you have Christ and eternity past, right? Then he came to earth. He lived for about 33 and a half years. He died on the cross. He was resurrected from the grave. Okay? He's going to come again in the clouds. And this is where the believers are going to be called up in the clouds. The Bible says to meet Jesus where? In the air, in the heavens. Okay? Then there's going to be a time of seven years. Okay? Seven year period. That period is called the tribulation. The first part of the tribulation is where the Antichrist sets up his throne and he brings peace. So there's going to be peace. He's going to be an incredible, charismatic ruler that's going to bring peace. But then at the end of the three and a half years, then the Antichrist is going to demand that you worship him. People, now remember, where are the, where's the church? The church is gone. But during this time, God is going to send different people to witness to those people who are here on earth. So for the last three and a half years, then the Antichrist is going to demand that you worship him. There's going to be a mark. Either people are going to get it on their right hand or on their forehead. That's going to be the mark of the beast. And the people who have that mark are already condemned to hell. But there are some people who will not receive the mark of the beast, and they will be killed. And then there's going to be one final rebellion. And in this one final rebellion, Jesus is going to come back with his angels. He's going to come back on a white horse, and he's going to kill all of his enemies. He's going to take Satan and put Satan for 1,000 years in a bottomless pit. And then Jesus is going to set up his reign on earth for 1,000 years. So for 1,000 years, Jesus is going to reign on earth. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. And then after the 1,000 year period, Jesus is going to free Satan from this bottomless pit. He's going to try to fight against Christ and fight against everybody who follows Christ. And then once and for all, Jesus is going to you know, destroy Satan and throw him in the lake of fire where he's going to burn forever and ever and ever. So notice, notice the progression. Notice where we are. We're, we're right here. We're waiting. Jesus can come any day now. He can. I mean, some people thought he was coming in Y2K, remember? Year 2000, people were freaking out. You know, bunkers, food. I mean, they were just going crazy. But the reality is, he can come any day. And then, when he comes, he's going to take us home. And then, that's when the world is going to say, I knew those aliens were real. You know, the aliens have taken all my friends, and they're gone. But what I want you to see in all of this, is Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. And one day, he's going to rule, and no one who stands against him will last. That's the encouraging thing for us. Everyone who stands against Christ will be killed or destroyed. Nobody will ultimately stand up and remain. So when it's all said and done, the people who are going to be with God forever are those who have accepted Christ as their Savior, either before He comes, during the tribulation, or even after the tribulation when he reigns for a thousand years because the idea is there's still going to be some people alive during this time and people will more than likely procreate. So, so that's the study of Jesus. You know, that's kind of like a big picture overview and, you know, what you have to keep in mind is these things are going to happen. It's like I told a friend of mine, you can't stop it, I can't stop it. They are going to happen. So what does it mean for this stuff to happen? It means that evil, evil is going to increase. Okay? It means that things aren't going to get better. Things are going to get worse. 
because the Antichrist is going to be the political and social uniter of all people. He's going to bring order to chaos, especially after all the Christians leave. So but what I want you to see in all this is how Jesus, throughout all of this, he, he comes to redeem his people. He comes to take his people home with him. And then at the end, he comes to destroy all the enemies of God. And then he reigns forever. So the last class that we're going to have is going to be, Albert's going to teach it. It's going to be on the book of Revelation. It's not next week. We still have a couple of weeks. But that class, he's going to give us an overview of the book of Revelation. And again, it's a, it's a fascinating book. But the main thing in the book of Revelation is that Jesus wins. Okay, don't try to figure out every single detail about the, the dragon and this. I mean, some of that stuff you can get really lost in. But the big picture is Jesus wins. And if Jesus wins, if we're with Jesus, guess what? We win. We win. All right. Any questions? I'm not sure what time it is, but any questions? Yes. What about all the other religions? What about all the other religions? Good question. Here in this time period, there, what we see in the book of Revelation is that there's going to be one religious system. Okay, there's going to be one religious system, and the Antichrist is going to develop his own religious system, which he is at the center of the religious system. There's going to be um, the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. That is called the unholy trinity. The beast the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And the Bible says they're going to perform signs and wonders and all kinds of, you know, just amazing things to deceive those who reject God. That's what's going to happen. So all of the other religions, you know, will have an opportunity to follow Christ or not follow Christ. You know, that is, that is what it's going to come down to. It's, it's not going to come down to what are your traditions. It's going to come down to who do you submit to. You know, in Islam, for an example, their motto is you submit to Allah. I mean, it's very, it's very clear. I mean, it's, it's very clear. It, it's no, well, you know, if you feel good, you know, pray. No, no, it is full submission. You are... You know, you are not part of the equation. It's full submission. Biblical Christianity is the only religion that speaks of, of a person who's risen from the grave, who is prophet, priest, king, savior, Lord. I mean, it's, it's the only one. So I think as we, as we look at this, again, knowing what we know about God, God is perfectly just. This is something I learned several years ago. God is perfectly just. That's what the scripture tells us. And if that's true, that means God will give everyone an opportunity to know Christ, to accept Christ, to reject Christ. And those who have never heard of Christ, God will judge them justly. So we are not just in all of our judgments. We're just, we're just not. You know, we're not perfect. But God will perfectly judge everyone according to what they know. Okay, what's been revealed, that's how he will judge them. Okay, so this is, you know, it's pretty amazing, and it's something that's going to happen. Any other questions? Where did the Jewish culture <clears throat> get their expectation of the coming Messiah when it's clear from what we went through tonight right. how he would arrive at what he would do? Why, why don't they accept it? Ma many times what you find, he's asking why, why does a Jewish culture not accept Christ? There are many, many reasons. Um, some of them believe the story of the Romans, which is his disciples came by night and they took him. That's one. Um, some of them, you know, don't believe he was born of a virgin. They say, hey, we know his family, we know his, his history. So, but many of them, I would say, were waiting for the prophet who would be the political leader, the social unifier, the next king of Israel on earth. And I think that's the main reason. 
that's the main reason. Because, yeah, they don't look at Isaiah 53, but they have what they forget, though, all of this stuff was prophesied that would happen. But for whatever reason, I mean, I guess what makes sense to me is when the scripture says, looking ahead at, you know, the future, where God will open their eyes. So it's almost like God has blinded their eyes for some reason. They can't see things the way God wants them to see. But in the right time, God will open their eyes so that they can see. You know, throughout history, there's always been what the Bible calls a remnant. A group of people, not the biggest group, but there's always been a group of people who have followed, you know, Christ the Messiah. But that's not the majority. But there's always been a group of people who have followed Christ as Messiah, who are of Jewish Hebrew descent. But I, I think the big stumbling block is not so much is Jesus, you know, Jewish? Is he, you know, did he die on the cross? I think those things are pretty clear historically. I think it's simply he was not what we expected. So therefore, we, we reject him. I think that's what it comes down. And again, there's several different views on it. Those are just a few. Jan, Jan um, and I lived in Boca Raton for 13 years. And <coughs> the predominantly population of Boca Raton is Jewish. And most of the people that we spoke to there over the years that we lived there, they, just like Marcel said, they believed he was a prophet, but a prophet only. Not mm -hmm. anything close to a king or the right. Messiah. Yeah. And yeah. It, that's just with, you know, yeah. anything you would say, they, they would, like you said, it, It's almost like the Muslims. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, exactly. Right. It's like the Muslims, very similar. The, Mo the Muslims say he's a prophet. Right. They say, yeah, Jesus is a prophet. They even say he's a good teacher. But that he's the son of God, you know, and, and that's where that's where the dividing line comes. And, and I think, again, you know, our prayer is, Lord, just open their eyes because it is a spiritual it is a spiritual battle. It, it really is. And again, what Satan wants to do is just deceive people, make them think that, you know, our religions are the same. Doesn't matter who you follow. You know, in the end, God's going to sort it out. Love wins in the end. You know, it's not true. It's not true, at least not according to what we read. Question, Victor? Question? Yeah, uh, I have, it's kind of, it might be a silly question, I don't know, but after the seven-year period, uh, I mean, if most people have already either, you know, gone up, or they have Mark, or they've been killed, is it going to be kind of like, like a Noah situation, where there's like a handful of people left, uh, we don't know how many, but we know a lot of people are going to die on earth. I mean, a lot of people are going to be killed because of their faith. The Antichrist is essentially going to declare war against anyone who, is, who doesn't have the mark. He's going to declare war. Because you're either with the Antichrist or you're against him. If you accept the, the mark on your right hand or your forehead, you are you are saying you submit to him, you worship him. If you don't, then that means you are following God and you're going to be killed. But, yeah, how many people and all that? I don't, I don't really know. It just says people, you know, it doesn't give specifics on numbers. But a lot of people, I mean, right before this happens, there are going to be incredible plagues. All the water, rivers, canals, oceans, streams, are going to be turned to blood. Okay, so we can't live that long without water, right? So that's going to be a, a, one of those plagues that, you know, there's going to be large hailstones coming from the heavens, killing people, setting people on fire. There's going to be scorpion-like figures coming. I mean, it's just going to be, it's going to be beyond words. But with all of that done, some people miraculously will say, again, people are going to hide in the mountains. People are going to hide you know, in all these places. And some people will be left. We don't know how many, but some of those obviously will procreate and have children. And even some of those children will rebel against God in the final rebellion when Satan is released. So it's hard to believe that after all of these things, there will still be people who rebel against God knowing what they know. That's the amazing thing. 
So thank God for our faith. Thank God that he saved us, that he has shown us, you know, the way. But, you know, I would not want to live in this time right here, these does seven say, years. Does it say anything of, I guess, where that <clears throat> drawing where you have where the, the people start to go to the, uh, to the sky? Does it say anything about the people that we, I'm sure all of us know, people that are non-believers that, does it say anything that they could be? Say yes, they, yeah. After this period, there is no doubt. You know, if we've been talking to a friend, family member about Christ for 15 years, and you know, all of a sudden we're gone, and they say, "Wait a minute, everybody that's gone was a Christian," and you know, but now their faith is going to cost them a lot more than it's costing us. That's the difference. Maybe not for the first three and a half years, but after that. If they're still alive, it's going to cost them. Does Jesus kill the Antichrist? Yeah. No. He kills the Antichrist, the false prophet, and he takes Satan and he casts them. And they all go into the, the lake of fire. Yeah, which is, you know, torment forever and ever and ever. Yeah, but he does. He kills his enemies with his spoken word. All right? So let me have a word of prayer. And then if you have any more questions, I'll stick around. But that way, those of you who need to go, what time do you have, Henry? 7.20. 7.20? Oh, we finished good. All right, good. Good time. All right. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Lord. It's such a fascinating study to learn about you and what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will continue to do. And Lord, I pray as we, as we share our faith, as we talk to others about you, that we would remember, Lord, that you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. So Lord, help us to be humble as we talk to people. Help us to study and learn more about these things. And, and Lord, help us to be gracious as we speak to people, remembering there was a time that we didn't know you. There was a time that we were without hope, without a Savior. And Lord, now that we have that living hope, may we be faithful to share that with others. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here tonight. I pray that you give them a, a safe trip home. Give them a good week. Bless them this week and all that they do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.